Hi, I'm Conrad Houghton and this is Lecture 5 in the Information Theory section of our unit Information Processing the Brain. In this uh, short lecture I'm going to talk quite briefly about the data processing inequality. So we'll start with snakes and ladders. This is snakes and ladders. Uh, I'm sure you all know it. It's a game of pure chance that's quite uh, popular or certainly used to be popular among children. You have a token. Uh, for these purposes I've used an old sixpence since it looks like a pretty old snakes and ladders board. Uh, you roll two dice or a dice to die. Uh, you work out the uh, total, some number between uh, 2 and 12, and you'd move that number of steps forward. If you start, get, find yourself at the bottom of the ladder, um, then you come automatically go to the top of the ladder, so like so. If you find yourself at the top of a snake, the mouth of a snake, you slide down to the tail of, of the snake. Uh, remarkably, uh, on this particular board, you can get to 99 in just three rolls. So if the first roll is a 4, you go from 1 to 5, you go up the ladder, then if the next roll is a 4, Again, you go up the ladder, and then if you roll the three, you get to the top of the ladder, and you're there at 99. Uh, obviously, we shouldn't really be thinking about the positions at the bottom of the ladder because you automatically go to the top. So let's just uh, notate this in terms of the rolls. So you roll uh, a four to get to the bottom of the ladder, starting the green square of five. That brings you to 15. You roll another four, 19, then you're at 60. Uh, you roll the three, and you turn 99. That's not the only way of getting to 99 in three rolls. So here's another go. Uh, you roll uh, an 8, so you end up in the square 9. You then roll a 10. You once again end up at the top of the uh, ladder, bringing you to 60. Now it's the same as before. You roll a 3, uh, you're at 99, and there you're done. So uh, let's think a little bit about the probabilities. We'll use x as the random variable of the result of the uh, where you are at the end of the first move. So this is going to have a value somewhere between 2 and 13, because Oh no, 3 and 13, because the lowest roll you can have is two ones, giving you a 3. The highest roll you can have is, is a 12. Uh, y is where you are at the end of the... Oh, it's also, sorry, true, the x could have the value um, 15 or 34. Um, if you roll a 4, obviously, as we saw, you end up at 15. If you roll a 7, you end up at 34. Uh, so the, 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 the sample space of these... Um, uh, random variables is slightly complicated in a way that's not very interesting. So uh, y is where you are after the second move, and z is where you are at the end of the third move. And what we're interested here is the probability that z uh, is equal to 99. Interested for the purpose of this, this example. Uh, and I worked it out. Uh, so obviously um, there's a, a number of different routes you can take, so you have to add up, you know, one route we looked at was a 4 and a 4 and a 3, another route would be a, uh, an 8 and a 10 and a 3. And obviously the different uh, dice rolls have different values because to get a 4 you can get a 1 and a 3 or a 3 and a 1 and a 2 and a 2. Uh, but uh, you can work it out easily enough or write a short program to work it out for you. And we find that the probability uh, of getting to z, of z being equal to 99, in other words, getting to the 99 square after three moves is 0 0.0031. So you have uh, just more than a, a point three percent chance of doing it so you'd probably have to play the game you know off the order of 300 times uh, to do that uh, but imagine how happy you'd be if you if you finally uh, managed it it would be really cool but not worth playing snakes and ladders 300 times so uh, now let's think a little bit about the conditional probabilities so obviously uh, once you know what you got in the first roll that's going to change your probability of um, of getting 99 at the end of the third roll the point I'm trying to make here is as uh, I as we'll see, is that the, uh, the distribution of z, or the probability that z is e conversely, or by implication, the probability that z is equal to 99, uh, that distribution is independent uh, of the value of x. And so if x is equal to 15, in other words, uh, if you roll a 4 and you end up in the 15 square, your probability of getting to 99 after 3 moves is uh, higher. It's 0 0.0046. It increases by 1.5 times, basically. Um, if you uh, did the other move, uh, annoyingly, uh, this was a poor choice because your probability stays the same. Basically, it's because the probability of getting a 10 is the same as the probability of getting a 4. But uh, if your first roll was a 12, uh, you end up with a, a pretty good chance, well, not a pretty good chance, but a much better chance uh, of getting to the, the 99. It's a 0 0.0077, uh, almost 0.8% chance. And as an extreme example, if you rolled a, a 7 at the start, you'd end up at, at 34. And once you're there, although in some ways that's quite a good move, it gets you quite far along the board, it doesn't make it impossible uh, to get to 99 in uh, two more rolls. So the distribution of Z uh, 
depends on uh, the value of x. x and z, as I said, are uh, not, not, in, not independent. But uh, that same thing is, is also true of, of uh, z and y. You know, if you uh, know where you are after two moves, well, that knowledge changes your distrib the distribution you uh, have for, for z. Uh, quite dramatically, in fact. I mean, if you know that you're at, um, uh, at 60 after two moves, uh, then you've actually got a 5.5% a, a chance in other words, the probability of rolling a 3 of getting to the 99. So the, um, the x and the, uh, sorry, the, the y and the z are similarly uh, not independent. If you know the value of y, that will change the probabilities you attribute to the different possible values of z. Um, and in particular, it, it affects the probability of z equals 99. But the, um, the point here, or the interesting thing here, is that once you know uh, your y, uh, then knowing how you got to that y um, doesn't change your, uh, your probability. In other words, uh, once you, if you know that y is equal to 60, uh, then uh, your probability for z equals 99 is 0.0556, irrespective of the route that you took uh, to get to y equals to 60. The probability of um, z equals 99 depends only on the value of y if you know y. If you don't know y, then uh, the value of x affects your probability uh, for z. If you do know y, then you don't care uh, what the values of, of x were. So uh, to get to y equals to 60, you could have had, um, you could have gone to 15 and then, uh, you know, and, and then rolled the required four to get to 60, or you could have gone to 13 and then rolled the required six uh, to get to 60. It, it really doesn't matter. Once you know why, knowing x tells you nothing more uh, about the distribution. So uh, this is just writing the formula around what I just said. The probability of z, z equals 99 given that y is equal to 60 is the same as the probability that z equals 99 given that y equals to 60 and x equals to 15, or it's the same as the probability uh, that z equals 99 given that y equals 60 and x equals 10. So x and z... Um, are dependent, but only in the absence of the knowledge of y. Once you know y, then uh, x and z become independent. In other words, x and z are conditionally independent. The probability of x and z, the joint probability of x and z, conditioned on y, uh, is just the multiple of the two distributions. Once you know z, then knowing x tells you nothing more uh, about z or the probability of x and z given y is the probability of x given y multiplied by the probability of z given y. The distribution, the joint distribution of x and z is not independent. The joint distribution conditioned on y is independent. And but the way we think about that in this sort of slightly Bayesian uh, language of um, probability distributions, sorry for the misspelling, uh, is that the, uh, the x affects z only through y. So x affect the, the, um, the position after one roll affects the position after three rolls only through the position after two rolls. So the information that comes from, um, or the, uh, the causality that comes from x to z must flow through y. And we write it uh, in this form here, x arrow y arrow z. It's, a, it's what we call a Markov chain. And again, um, uh, x, y, and z form a Markov chain, x, arrow, y, arrow, z, uh, if x and z are conditionally uh, independent, conditioned on y. And apologies again for the misspellings. And the uh, condition for that is given there. The data processing inequality tells us that if x, uh, y, and z form a Markov chain, then the information that, uh, uh, the mutual information between x and y so this is the information shared between x and y, is greater than the information uh, between x and z. In other words, um, the, if you go to the two ends of the Markov chain, the x and the z, the amount of information x holds about z, or conversely, the amount of information z holds about x, that overlap we saw in the diagram in lecture four, that is necessarily smaller than the uh, overlap between uh, x and y. Okay, uh, And there's... Um, there's an equality condition, which is basically if uh, x, z, and y are uh, also a Markov chain. And that basically says that uh, z and y have the same, hold the same information about x. So 
the data processing inequality, it tells us that as we go down a, a, a processing chain, we get the information X, we do Y with it, Y might be some um, processing step, but we throw some stuff away, we might, be, we might be a noisy processing step, so you add some noise, and then you go on and you uh, produce the, the output Z. That, that chain will only ever reduce the amount of information. So you, know, you can come up with uh, neuroscience analogs, you, uh, you have um, examples, you have information coming you know, in light to your eyes, the retinal cells do some processing and they send some signal uh, to, to V1, the cells at the back of the brain, they send some signal to V2. The amount of information is always being reduced. So if X is the visual scene uh, and the Y is the activity of the retinal cells and Z is the activity of the V1 cells, then the activity here has to have less information about the input uh, than, um, than Y, the, the, the retinal cells. You can't, um, well, here's a slogan, processing extracts information the, the moral here is that when you think about what happens to information in a processing sequence, a set of processing steps, it might extract the information you want, uh, but it can't um, uh, add information. The amount of information is always reduced as you go uh, down the processing. Now, uh, I don't want to push this too far. Uh, I mean, there is a theorem, again, I haven't proved it, that says that if X, Y, and Z is a Markov chain, then the mutual information between X and Y is greater than the mutual information between X and Z. Any interpretation depends exactly, as I tried to outline before, um, how you're conceptualizing uh, you know, the, the, the brain. You know, the information is being passed from place to place. You have to be careful about what, how, how you're thinking about, about that, that sequence of, of steps. You know, you can um, confuse yourself by trying to push information theory interpretations of the brain or indeed in information theory interpretations of uh, machine learning architectures, deep learning architectures. But the, the moral is still there. The thing that information theory quantifies is something that is only um, reduced by processing. Thank you.